Actually, that's what you know. I realize when people keep friends with me, like, people who know me keep friends with me, it's because my link is around. So I change that. Do you want pizza? I mean, I think it's crazy. Water or something like that? Yes. So, um, there is a little fridge out here. We can hook you up with stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, so what I would have you do is just uh, I'll just, I'll set it up, I'll take it to going and just make sure. Like I said, I'm just gonna, I'll just hit record and then when it, uh, when I craft out, you just hit this button right there until it starts. That's all I got to do. Yeah, so just keep, you know, just keep, keep an eye on it every now and then. Every one. Just like lamps. It shouldn't, it should probably report. Really, just like it'll be. Yeah, like he checks in. This grid will be a grid will show you the one that's going, and he's just like a few blocks in it. Yeah, and he starts seeing a battery flash or something like that. That's one of the ones I'm hoping to get. Yeah, I'm to the guys. Yeah, I'm to the guys. I'm going to go to the the guys. I'm going to go to 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 the I need some more. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's some people who are so good at it. Yeah, very, very good at it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Visual. Oh, is there a lesson in the Cool. <laughs> He's a pretty cool girl. You'll, uh, you'll enjoy it. Yes, right. So do you do coding? Oh yeah. For what? Like a random freelancer? I'm interested in this. So I've been trying to learn about how to do some consulting on the food. So I'm going to try to find some professional programs in the next world. Of course. I was going to want to do something, read something, try to do something. But I was going to say, it's 
I remember looking at the first and saying, why am I going to try to put it in my
people hacking away that you can hang out with and teach or learn from or find a person that works on the same kind of weird project that you do and make friends. Uh, bathrooms are down this way, all the way, on the right. The drinks out there are for us to consume. Feel free to go at them. There's little, two little fridges. Pizza makes you thirsty, so don't, don't get the We'll talk more about the pizza in a second. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I have a request. So we're probably going to fill up as people trickle in. You could indulge me and you know, scooch in, scooch so that people don't have to walk over you. Especially, over especially you guys over there. Thank you. 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 What else? What else? Um, the next presentation night. The next presentation night is in the end of June. Um, the 25th, I believe, and we will have a topic of machine learning, and we will have a speaker who is coming from even farther away than tonight's speaker has come. So it should be very interesting. The pizza. Is the pizza good? <coughs> Yay! Yay. <laughs> All right, how much did you pay for the pizza? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. That's because Ooh La La paid for the pizza. And to tell you why, Brian is here to explain it. Hey, how are you? Uh, thanks for having me. And I, I know that a couple slices of pizza only gets me a limited amount of your attention, so uh, I'll be brief. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know Rula La, we're um, a very successful uh, flash sale e-commerce site. If you don't know what flash sale means, and your requests per second go from 200 to 1,500 to 3,000 in the space of a minute, and they hang out there. So architecting and designing a system for that sort of scalability is a, it's an interesting engineering challenge. And, and we're uh, at the early stages of re-engineering the next generation platform to go cloud versatile and using technologies like Varnish and Redis. It's all written in Python, Django. Some really interesting stuff, challenging problems, good people, and I think that's about all the time. Two slices of pizza, five. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, when we're done here tonight, about nine o'clock, maybe a little earlier, um, we're going to be heading over to Mead Hall, which is a nice bar with lots of beers. It's about three blocks from here, and the drinks there will also cost you nothing. Um, and that is because our speaker tonight is from Heroku, and Heroku is buying the drinks, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so definitely don't rush out of here when the talks are done, because we can hang out for an hour or two at the meat hall and have free beer. Um, that might be it. That might be it. Okay. So tonight, our speaker is Kenneth Wright. Is that how you say it? Right. Yes. Yes. So Kenneth is a very well-known speaker in the Python universe. Um, and he was just telling me that he was just last week at DjangoCon EU in Poland. So he is in demand worldwide, and we are very lucky to have him here tonight. Um, Kenneth is the author of a well-used library called Requests, which you may be using in your own projects. Um, I like that the code got applause before the guy got applause. <laughs> that's, that's, that's always a, nice a good touch. touch. Um, Request is a very well-loved library, you can see, for doing things that URL lib does, but it does it in a nicer way. 
Kenneth's talk tonight called Python for Humans is based around the things he's noticed about designing APIs, and a lot of it has to do with yeah. requests. So let's yeah, give him a big hand. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing today? You good? Good. Awesome. Good. Is my audio? Good. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> so, um, hello everybody. My name is Kenneth Wright. So you can follow me on Twitter at, at Kenneth Wright if you'd like. Um, and I come from a company called Heroku. Uh, Heroku is basically a really great platform for deploying applications uh, that are written in Python. And if you want to talk to me more about that later, uh, I'd be happy for you to, especially while we're enjoying free beer. Um, I'm also a member of the Python Software Foundation. And if you know what I do, or if you're familiar with my work, it's probably from the open source that I do. Um, I wrote a library called uh, Requests, which is HTTP for humans. Basically, it's really hard to get uh, to, to send HTTP requests in Python, and I try to make that as simple as possible. But we're going to get into that in a minute. Um, I also wrote a project called HTTP bin, which is available either to install yourself or at httpbin.org. Uh, basically, it's really hard to test HTTP libraries and clients. So if you're like working with curl or like some JavaScript thing, uh, basically all these different libraries and tools are going to send different. Um, you're going to send different headers and other things like that when they're operating. And this tool allows you to keep up and analyze it. Um, so you know, like accept headers, for example, that's like different in curl than it is with URL lib two. So uh, if you use this tool, it'll allow you to like uh, get a good idea of what's going on. And you can ask it for like you know 304 or 44 or some kind of weird authentication scenario and it'll respond. Um, I also wrote a project called a Legit, which is a Git workflow um, utility for the command line. Basically, it's the workflow from GitHub for Mac brought to the command line. Uh, so like if you if you're working in different branches and uh, you switch between them a lot, you don't have to like stash and unstash and commit changes that aren't ready yet. It'll do that automatically for you. Um, Envoy, which makes sub processes easier, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, OS X GCC installer is pretty popular. It makes Apple's uh, lawyers very upset. <laughs> but we're on good terms now. So, as, uh, as I do all this stuff, when I write all this code, I really try to like, I love open source. It's like totally changed my life, and uh, it affects me every day, and I think it's amazing. And I try to open source everything in my life. I've gone so far as to actually open sourcing my genome. I got my uh, polyface, I believe it's called, from 23andMe, in a text dump, and it's available on GitHub. So you can fork me something if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pull request now for uh, improved, like, um, oh, what is it? Metabolism for caffeine. So <laughs> more working progress again. Um, so I, as I work more and more with open source, I realize when I'm working in an internal code base, or like something proprietary or secret, something that's only for me or my colleagues, I realize that. If I pretend that the project is open source, there's a lot of really good things that start to happen. The components start to become concise and decoupled from one another. You're not going to be using an open source project if it solves like 30,000 problems. Usually the best projects that we use have solved one or two or three problems really, really well. Uh, kind of follow the Unix philosophy. Concerns separate themselves from one another. A lot of best practices will emerge in your code. For example, if you're going to be building, like, say, a website, and you're going to be uh, pushing it up on GitHub for everyone to see, you're not going to put your database credentials into your code base. So you shouldn't be doing that internally either. I know none of us do that. Um, documentation and tests become absolutely crucial. Uh, you're not going to be using an open source project if it doesn't have any tests or any documentation. So you shouldn't be using that for your internal code either. And another side benefit of this is that if you ever do want to release your code as open source, you can, just flip at the switch, you know that you've already been building it that way all along, there's something you have to check. So, um, who here uses Python? Woo! <laughs> Excellent. I like this crowd already. We all come to Python for various reasons, and I think it's all about philosophy. We all share this really dark, evil, uh, depressing past. <laughs> we come from different languages like Perl or Java, PHP, ColdFusion, COBOL. Uh, lots of terrible, terrible things. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's all these things that attract us to Python from those languages that those languages lack. And 
this is all kind of consolidated in this thing called PEP20, uh, which is available at any Python interpreter. You just type import this, and you will see 19 uh, small little bite-sized chunks of what the Python philosophy is. And we're going to go over some of those today. Um, this is one of the most obvious ones when you're looking at Python syntax. It is that beautiful is better than ugly. Uh, if you look at a lot of other languages, uh, there's a lot of syntax that is added that has been removed from Python. You have things like curly brackets. Um, well, that's all you need to know. <laughs> that's the biggest one. Uh, there's a lot. Explicit is better than implicit. Uh, if you're working with a lot of languages like PHP and Ruby, there'll often be like little dollar sign uh, things that are just kind of available in the namespace that you don't know how they got there or where they were defined. Um, in Python, we try to make everything as explicit as possible. So you're going to import something into the local uh, um, namespace, and it'll be an interrupt either. Of course, you can do some crazy things in Python too. Those are frowned upon by everybody. Simple is better than complex, and complex is better than complicated. If the implementation is uh, hard to explain and it's a bad idea, unless of course you are <laughs> PyPy, <laughs> because no one except Rally Scanner can explain PyPy. And this is the one that we're going to touch the most on today, the most important one, I think, for us as a community. And it is that there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Um, a lot of languages like Py or sorry, like Perl or, uh, or Ruby really kind of ex they, they put a lot of focus on expressiveness, uh, which to them means that you can you know take a problem and approach it in, in a hundred different ways. And in Python, we try to do the opposite of that and only focus on one obvious way to do it. That doesn't mean that there, sh that there aren't other ways to do it, but there's one, one, there's one way that should be obvious. That's the only one that, uh, that should be the default. So, you, just learned, or you're, you decided that you want to learn Python. Uh, you're coming from like Ruby or something like that. And uh, you finally found a community that actually like, gets you, you know, they're, welcome to paradise, right? Like there, we have all these different things. It's right into the standard library. You just do import this and you get all of these great things that you've always wanted your language to do. It's going to be awesome. Fortunately, that's not always the case. So, I'm going to show you why. So, we're going to pretend that we know Ruby, and here's like a simple kind of hello world, uh, real hello world type of scenario here. We're going to be sending a simple request to, to GitHub with their API, our username and password attached, and we're going to get a response. And then we're going to try to port this code to Python, because that's kind of a simple web services oriented hello world. So, in Ruby, the uh, first thing you do is you import a library called net slash HTTP and a library called URI. You then uh, parse the URI, call it URI, get a reference to it, and you create a new net, uh, network connection, new HTTP connection, with the host and the port from, uh, from the parse URI. And you tell the connection to use SSL. And then you create a new GET request with the URL, you add your username and password, and you get a response. It was very, very verbose. <laughs> it was very verbose. And, uh, you know, it's not the cleanest thing in the world, but it's definitely, there's nothing here that is unexpected. Everything here is obvious, and everything here um, isn't totally cumbersome. So, the first thing you're going to do when you try to port this to Python is you're going to ask yourself, what is Python's version of the net HTTP library? And you're going to find a myriad of answers online. Uh, you'll find something called HTTP lib, you'll find HTTP lib 2, URL lib, URL lib 2, URL lib 3. And several hours later, what you're going to find is that the prognosis online seems to be that you need to be using URL lib 2. So, using the uh, official API and following the documentation and everything, this is going to be the code that we end up. And uh, let's go through it here. So the first thing you do is import URL lib 2, and you get your URL, and you create a new request object from URL lib 2 with that URL. And then you create a password, sorry, you instantiate a new HTTP password manager with a default realm. Uh, store that as a password manager. And then you add your password with reference to the URL using your password in it. And then you create the HTTP basic authentication handler uh, from the password manager called an auth manager. And then you install the, wait, you create an opener from the auth manager. And then you install the opener. And then you can open your URL and read the result of the socket. What the hell? That's the most complicated and convoluted thing I've ever seen. And it's actually much worse than that. So the GitHub API 
by default, if it's asking for a protected resource, like let's say you're asking for data on a private repo, <coughs> instead of asking for credentials with a 403, they respond with a 404, which kind of is like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about instead of let me see ID. So they don't want you to be able to guess people's repo names, basically. So to override the behavior, even though we explicitly told it to send a request on that, uh, on that you know, to send our username and password on that request, we have to add with code. <laughs> And this is the shortened version. I thought it was really good to go all the way down to the floor. And that's not fun. So admit it. If this was you, and this is your first interaction with Python after using Ruby, uh, I think you'd leave and you'd never come back. Uh, this, this, is not, this, isn't show, this is not what we are all about, right? Our philosophy, we stated very clearly that we have all these beliefs and all these things that are important to us, and we failed in every single one of those areas. It's unclear which module you're supposed to be using. There's no obvious way to do it. The uh, prognosis seems to be your early to, but once you get there, the docs don't actually tell you how to do much of the stuff, and the API leaves a lot to be desired. I think this is a very serious problem. HTTP <coughs> should be as simple as a print statement, because web services kind of build the whole world around us, right? Like, we're building all these tools that we talk about on the news every day, like right after someone gets elected, they're like, let's look at the tweets. Now, this is, all these tools are all built around HTTP, and that's super important. And I think a lot of developers, when getting started, or even in their day-to-day -day lives, if they're doing this every day, they're all going to be working with HTTP all day. So the solution is simple. I think we need to build elegant tools to perform these tasks. And I like to call these pragmatic packages. And I think Python needs a lot more of them. Pragmatic means dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical <coughs> rather than theoretical considerations. I like to call this Python for humans. So let's break HTTP down. What is it at its core? Basically, it's a fairly simple system uh, when you get down to the heart of it. It's a small set of methods with consistent parameters. You have uh, get requests, uh, head, post, push, put, patch, delete and all of them accept headers, URL parameters, body, and form data. URL 2, on the other hand, does not follow any of these patterns. It's very engineered. You only have access to a, to a get request, and it kind of automatically turns it into a post if you add extra data into the, into the request. Um, the docs are really hard to read, and uh, this really scares people away from Python. So enter requests, which is HTTP for humans. So they do this exact same thing with requests, you import requests, you have your username and password, and you make a request, and you get your response. And that's it. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. We have a small set of methods with consistent parameters, one for get, one for post, push, delete, all the rest, and they all accept headers, parameters, uh, URL parameters, body, and form data. That wasn't so hard, that was it. Do this. Do this for everything. The litmus test is if you have to refer to the documentation every time you use a module, find or build a new module. And to do this, I like to say that you need to fit the 90% use case. Basically, it's really easy to get hung over on people that are like, you're going to try to solve a problem for you and for the 90% use case. And there's going to be this other 10% of people who are going to complain that the API doesn't fit their use case. And you know, not, they have this weird thing that they do at work behind like 17 processors, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, your library doesn't suit their needs, and it's terrible, and no one should have used it. And uh, it's really important to learn how to ignore those people, basically. Um, yeah, there's lower level APIs that can be available to suit those people, but that's not what the 90% pragmatic Python for humans uh, package is. Um, the API is really all that matters, and everything else is secondary. And I mean everything. Features, efficiency, performance, corner cases, all these things are really important, but for a package like this, they are not as important as the API. So to do this, what I do is I write the readme before I write any code. Actually, I sit down and I think about what I want this library to do, and then I actually try to write some code with it as if it already existed. So I'll be like, import my library, and then I start using it, I say what the result is, and I go through all these steps, and then I go back and I try to do all the steps, I write all the code to make that possible. Um, so with requests, I did this, and it, like at first it worked, but it was really far from powerful. Uh, it wasn't very well architected internally, um, but it really did, resonated with a lot of people, and the features grew over time, and the API was never compromised. So today, 
Um, it supports cookies, sessions, uh, content generation, data tracking, all this crazy, awesome stuff. OAuth, connection pooling, uh, like really advanced things that all the other libraries don't do. Um, and the API is still as simple as it was originally. And it's been downloaded over 3 million times, and a lot of really great companies and organizations use it. So cool story, bro. Why am I telling you all this? Uh, basically, the moral of the story is that it's obvious that people need APIs like this. You know, if you're going to build something like this, people are going to be using it. And it's, uh, the success of this library shows that there's a real hunger for libraries that are easier to use. So if you take your time to build something like this as a developer, it'll definitely be worthwhile. If you can save five minutes, five minutes of one developer's time for yourself, think of you know, if you're saving 10,000 developers five minutes time, it makes a big difference. So um, that was the HTTP version of uh, the different barriers to entry in the Python ecosystem. Now I'm going to go over some of the more general barriers to entry that I've noticed, and I've uh, talked to you from people who teach Python a lot, uh, things that kind of bother me, and things we can do to fix them. So, first one, this one drives me crazy, uh, file and system operations in Python. Uh, if you ever have to interact with a system, there are like seven different modules that that magical function or method that you're looking for can exist in. And you have to Google every time to figure out which one it is. It's not uh, there's a S, there's sys, shutils, os, os.path, io, and that thing that you're looking for can be in any of them. And that really sucks. And that makes it, it's really difficult to run external commands in Python as well. Um, there's a subprocess module, which is great, but it just kind of bubbles up the C API. And it has like, if you look at the actual documentation, it's kind of crazy. There's like, I believe like 19 uh, different parameters to the main class, and it doesn't really tell you what any of them do or what the effects of them are. Uh, and that sucks, because if you look at a language like Ruby, they make running commands, external commands, really easy. And uh, I think that's a big reason that people are building all these uh, system utilities and um, you know, DevOps tools and made Ruby and that in Python. Um, installing Python. So who here has installed Python on a Mac? All right, who has installed it um, with Homebrew? Who uses the system Python? Who uses the one from Macports or Fink? Who built it from source? And who installed it from um, python.org? All right, so what happened there being only one obvious way to do it? <laughs> like, the very most fundamental thing that we do as language users is install the language, and that, even that is something that is not there's no obvious way to do it. It really sucks. Um, it's terrible. So, you know, you have to decide if you're using Python 2 or 3 right now. I think that's going to get a lot easier soon, but it'll get worse before it gets better. Um, you have to decide if you want 32-bit or 64-bit. Uh, if you're building for the Mac, you need to decide if you want a Unix or a framework build. Um, it's a very poorly documented thing. So, there should be one, preferably only one obvious way to do it. Uh, XML help. E-tree is very frustrating. Uh, to a lot of people. LXML is a really great library, but it can be difficult to install a lot of times, and the error messages you get trying to install different libraries that have C extensions uh, are um, at least something to be desired. Uh, LXML actually does something really cool. If some of the libraries that it needs aren't available, it actually will get them itself and statically compile itself against them, which is something that I like to see a lot of other libraries start to do. Um, so if you install, if you're using Assistant Python on Mac, You'll notice that there's this easy install command available when you're not using it and everything's great. Um, and then what you, do, you don't realize if that's your first interaction with Python that's you know easy install isn't available. It's not built into Python at all. That's something that you know, Apple put into their Python. That's something that you normally have to install. Um, so that's like an unobvious barrier to entry. Uh, you have to decide right now if you need to use pip or easy install. Uh, if you are using easy install, there's no easy uninstall, uh, which sucks. Um, setup tools appears to be built into, into Python uh, when you're using it on the Mac, as I said. Let's see. And people often release packages onto the G-Shop, or they don't release them onto the G-Shop, but they say they release them. So they're like, should we use our library? Just do pip install, git plus git, you know, colon github.com slash, you know, their library. And uh, that's unfortunate. But it's getting better. Day times. These ones are fun. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, if you're trying to do something with dates, you have to figure out which module you want to use. There's a date time, date time, calendar, uh, libraries. If you pip install date util, 
on Python 2, when you import it, it will fail because it installed the Python 3 version, unless you explicitly say you want version 1.5, uh, which is unfortunate. Time zones, let's go skip that one. <laughs> of course, everyone should just use UPC all the time, and then everything goes away. <laughs> and uh, the standard library can generate but not parse 86, uh, ISO 8601 dates. Unicode? Oops. Unicode. That's, uh, that's a really big one. I think that this is getting better. Thanks but, to Ned. What was that? Thanks to Ned. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a big barrier to entry. I think better docs will have. We'll skip that one. Uh, testing. There are many testing libraries and runners available. Um, I know in Python 3 they just added a new uh, test runner thing. I'm not, I haven't looked at it too closely. But that should help. But there's uh, right now, if you want to like, run unit tests, um, you can use Node, you can use PyDot test. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones that like will run them for you, but it's not obvious which one is best and for what uses. Um, a big thing that I notice people doing is they, use, they find doc test, which is really great for testing things locally. Like it's great for testing if your documentation is correct, or it's good for testing a little script that you wrote. Um, but you know, people will build very robust applications, uh, and they'll use doc tests as their only form of tests, uh, which leads to pretty poor tests. Um, so it should be like in the documentation, uh, you know, what the uses of this library for. Uh, installing dependencies. The Python MySQL library, uh, this one gives me a headache every time I try to install it. I can never remember the name of it. Because there's like Python MySQL or Python MySQL DB or DB Live MySQL Python something. Uh, my solution to that is to just use Postgres instead. The <laughs> um, Python Imaging Library has a lot of uh, problems being installed for a lot of people. Uh, if you're on a Mac, it's like it's like two commands away for having it installed perfectly. You just have to like brew install uh, the PNG library and the JPEG library, and then suddenly everything works. Um, but you know, getting getting to the getting that far is a, like it's not the documentation. I mean, you're going to get these weird errors when you try to install things. It sucks. Um, we're using ModWizzy. You have, so a lot of people use ModWizzy, it's fantastic. Um, but what happens when they're using it in a bunch of systems is they often don't understand how installation of it works. And they'll just kind of use them when it's available in, um, in AppKit. And what happens is they don't know what version of Python they're running, and they don't feel they have the control to even modify it if they do. So I've gone to a lot of companies where I start to work and help them with the code base, and I'll be like, so what version of Python are you guys using? And they have no idea. You know, they're just like, I use the one that comes with, you know, the one that comes with my whiskey, um, which is unfortunate. So I think that focusing more on decoupling those things is, uh, is better. So my solution to these problems, uh, my attempt to help, is called Hitchhiker's Guide to Python. It's available at python-guide.org. And of course, it teaches you to don't panic and always carry a towel. Uh, basically, what it does is it documents all of our best practices. As we learn the language of Python, and as we become more ingrained to the culture and the ecosystem, there's a lot of tribal knowledge that we learn. And I'm trying to basically serialize as much of that as possible. Because these things should be written down, they should be documented. Um, so if you're a newcomer to Python, you know you don't have to spend those years trying to get all this knowledge out. It should be written down somewhere. This will ideally be a place where people can go and get that. And if you're a seasoned veteran, let's say you've been doing scientific computing for 10 years and you want to switch to web development, you, know, you still have to go through that tribal knowledge phase. So ideally, you'll be able to come to this and we'll just tell you the frameworks that are available that you should be using. You know, it'll be opinionated, um, and everything will be a lot better. So it'll recommend distribute and pip, uh, virtual env out of the box. And it'll have explicit installation directions <laughs> for every operating system. Uh, it'll instill a resistance to doc test and teach everyone to use datetime.utc now instead of dot now and save everyone a lot of headaches. So I'm hoping that everyone in the room here who has any experience with Python in any way, and I saw your hands before, there's a lot of you, uh, will send pull requests to this project because we all have different aspects and we know the different things that we went into that causes problems. And uh, that's the only way to get all this tribal knowledge that ever brings. So if you go to the GitHub repo, you go to the website, there's a little fork button in the corner. Um, basically, if it's a good change, and I think I've only rejected like two pull requests ever out of like several hundred to it, um, I'll merge it, and it'll be live on the site within like 10 seconds. So if you do that, just remember there's only one rule, 
and it's that there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. This makes Python more accessible, lowers the barrier to entry, it sets developers on the right path, and it allows us to practice what we preach. So, manifesto of talk is simplify terrible APIs and document our best practices. Any questions? Yes. So, one thing I've always been really curious about with your request library is that I believe it's built on top of URL link too. So it used to be. It used to be. Yes, originally it was. It was okay. the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I was curious about. My question was, how do you how do you decide when to build on top of core APIs, and how do you decide when to try to circumvent them? So, um, the original plan for it was basically, you know, I, I wasn't. Uh, intimately familiar with all of the um, aspects of HTTP. So I, I basically was trying to build, I, I thought, here's the API I want for this other thing. And I just kind of had to become intimately familiar with URL2 to get to do what I wanted. Um, and I just started scripting it. And it became very troublesome very quickly. Um, and it became uh, shockingly obvious that it was a huge problem. Because like, so when we trying to send like an HTTP digest request and like it, with certain response codes it wouldn't get, you know, and all this stuff was happening that there was no code for in my code base and I couldn't find it before in URL2 either. Uh, it became very obvious that it wasn't, it wasn't helping at all. So I, uh, I went back and I implemented it all in HTTP and my life became tremendously easier, basically. So, I don't know, I think I think ideally you should be able to try to implement it in something, you know, prototype it. And it should be pretty obvious if it's a good idea or not. Um, especially as new features get added, it, it should be, become pretty obvious how flexible the architecture is. And that was that was a big thing for me. It was the architecture was so horrendous that it was like impossible for me to add very simple features. Um, and I think learned a lot of that way. Awesome. More questions? We have lots of questions. There are ones that you asked on the RSVP, and I can ask those for you, but it would be better if you ask them. Corey? I have a different one than I asked. Fine. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on uh, the unit test module specifically? Like you talked about, there's all these different test runners, mm -hmm. but when you're in the module, it's very like Java-like, it's very weird. There's a lot of strange things like what's a text test result, what's all, all these different hierarchies yeah. of runners and stuff like that. Do you have any suggestions or thoughts on what to do about that library? I think it's the status quo and I, my opinion at the moment is that everybody use it. I actually uh, started a fork of it uh, for fun. It was called unit underscore test and it was just a pep eight version of it. <laughs> it just, you know, it wasn't the you know, camel case yeah. basically. Um, but I, I, it was a waste of time so I didn't, I didn't do it. Um, but I think there's a lot of work that could be done there. I really do like what pi.test does. It, it'll just take assert statements and turn them into, uh, you know, it'll make, make more proper exceptions out of them, which is really cool. But um, I just found out that if you do the dash dash oo, uh, you know, you do the optimized, I guess what it stands for, uh, flag to Python, it just like skips asserts all the time. I like, guess that's supposed to be more efficient, uh, which is the worst thing ever. So. Uh, Assert statements as syntax apparently aren't <coughs> something that you should be doing. I do them all the time, though. So. Well, I think they're going to remove it. In Python. But, yeah. I don't know. Remove what? Uh, so is it dash? It's the optimized flag yeah, for Python. Yeah. It yeah. skips. It'll it's, skip the, uh, the assert statements, right? Yeah. 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 Compile them out. Which is, like, I, I like use it. them for, for both of them. <laughs> don't, don't, don't run with the optimized flag. That's I don't. I mean, I doing it for you. Exactly. I never. I never have. I think someone's going to fix it, so it just it just takes out the talk strings and, and keeps the asserts. I think that was what the discussion was. I'd be very surprised if that happened. At least on Twitter, Twitter I didn't see the mailing lists. <laughs> I, I avoid mailing lists. <laughs> yes. What is the one obvious way that we're to debug Python? Ooh. Uh, uh, what is the one obvious way to debug Python code? And I'll give you my honest answer. Very which is the wrong one for everybody, but it's print statements. <laughs> <laughs> Although Python 3 gets harder, you have to put two extra parentheses around it, and it drives me insane. If you haven't tried, 
you haven't tried P U D B yet? Right. P U D B. P U D B. Yeah, it's like P D B. It's got the same commands, but it's it's character mode full screen, so you can oh. see your code with a line going up and down instead of printing out statements as oh, it goes. Nice cool. Can you patch? Can I? No. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> yes. Do you have any advice on uh, installation and configuration of third-party things? The example I would use was I just was doing a project with OpenCV, and there's six million optional dependencies like JPEG libraries and MPEG, this and this and this. And if some of them aren't working, some of the code doesn't work. And if they are, you do want to get them all there. There's a, about a million app get statements, sometimes with changing package names and so on. Yeah. Is there a way to make that easier? Um, to date, I don't think so. I think this is actually one of the most difficult, like, unsolved problems in at least my world. So it's just like system dependencies and declaring them. Uh, not just for Python, but for anything. Like at Roku, it's really difficult for us to, like, if you want to have an obscure system dependency, you have to just basically make a tarball of it and, like, write a script that extracts it. Which sucks, like, there should be a real way to do that, but I'm not aware of anything to do that today, other than relying, you know, marrying a certain um, packaging system. Although in um, Just Utils 2, there's a new directive called Requires External, um, and it doesn't actually do anything on its own. It's just a metadata a slot. And you, it basically, the thought is that you can just have strings in there, and then ideally you could have something that maps those to whatever system you're using. So you can just have like you know, open CV version whatever, and then you know you could extract how to install that from that. Um, but I haven't seen anybody do that yet. Uh, I think that that is a path we will go down, but it's kind of unclear still. Um, I've heard really good things about the Nix package manager as well, NIX, um, which is like a, I know a lot of Clojure people really like it because it's it's like a a list like a functional package manager. Um, but I don't know a lot about it. But uh, those are the things I know we've explored internally, and that uh, I'd love to see people start working on that more because it affects everybody, and it's something that we never talked about. So, yeah, yes. Um, I guess I'm, maybe I don't fall in the ninety percent use case, but I'm wondering if you thought about ways of supporting uh, more hooks mm -hmm. or ways of uh, swapping in alternate implementations of the things that a request object uses, like your own dict-like object for headers. Or yes. uh, I know PyCurl lets you provide file-like objects for uh, reading and writing uh, requests and <coughs> So um, a big challenge is I was trying to improve the API and, and remove functionality. I used to have like a lot of hooks. Uh, like, there was like four of them, I believe, different types that it would basically call back. Um, that it would use if they were provided. And I, I, no one ended up using a lot of them, so I removed them, and I came up with a better system, I think, um, called connection adapters, which basically is like a class you you define, and it just, all it does is tell, it tells, it defines the entire way you, to take a request object and return a response. So the whole flow could be done completely, and overwrite all of it. So ideally you could have at least a, a bucket of files in the directory and pretend that it's a get request. Uh, and then it actually did HTTP. And that's the goal. It's um, it's in the documentation now, and people are using it for some cool stuff. But I haven't, uh, it's not something I pushed a whole lot yet. It's kind of experimental still. But is, do you think that would solve your use case? That sounds like it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> yes. Uh, Mike Schnapp, do you have an example of post request who had something very simple? Yes. Like something more XML like how you post things, how you get them back, and you do with that. So the question is how did you uh, an example of a post request? Post request yeah. and response. Yeah, full documentation. Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you. Basically instead of dot get you want Cambridge. Cambridge. <laughs> You can just minimize the screen cat So
Stuff up on that. No. <laughs> How do you turn this? There we go. So um, here's an example of a budget request. Basically, what I do is I have it so if you have, you, have a, you can provide a dictionary, um, which is the most common, I think, way of thinking about post data, um, and it'll automatically encode it uh, with um, URL encoding and do the post for you, uh, or not URL encoding, whatever they call it. There are lots of them. Uh, but you can also provide a string, or uh, a string, or a file-like object, and stream it up um, automatically. So that's the way you post. And then when you actually get the response, there's this uh, r dot text. That's that's the the text, the Unicode representation of that object, the response. And there's also r dot content, and that is the bytes version of it. So and that's the same on Python two and Python three. Um, it works pretty well. I also implemented a way for you to. It's undocumented at the moment. But if you have some really crazy post requests uh, for like streaming uploads, um, you can define this uh, basically this class, and it will tell it how to encode it as it's uh, as it's uploading. So if you wanted to have long streaming upload, you could like you know you know, something coming from a video stream or something like that. You could perpetually upload it with that. But um, almost no one. I'm waiting until someone asks for it before I actually document it because it's kind of crazy. <laughs> That's a good way for me to um, determine if something's worthwhile. Like I'll be implementing something, and uh, I'll think of this weird use case where you know it'll break for somebody, and I basically just um, wait to see if anyone says anything. And I'll think like this happened actually a couple weeks ago. Like I waited, it took like three months for someone to to ask about the thing that I was thinking of. Uh, so we solved it when he asked, but uh, it worked out really well. I did it for my blog too. I re-implemented my blog recently. And uh, I didn't I didn't bother building the RSS feeds, and so two months for someone to notice. So I determined it was a bad thing to spend my time on. <laughs> yes. First of all, I just like to echo the sentiment. I really appreciate you giving the talk tonight. Um, but what I was specifically curious about was in regards to the executable builders like ITC, would you um would you basically bless uh, in Denver to kind of clean up that area? Um, in regards to your philosophy, or are you kind of on the camp of no, this is the age of the web, <laughs> creating a desktop application for? So, so the question was, uh, what is my stance on tools like PyXE? Yeah. Um, and my, my personal stance is that they are fantastic, and uh, they are terribly implemented, and the worst thing ever to work with. I actually had like a full-time job for like a year of like, I had this PyQt application that I built and I was trying to build it with completely portable executables for Python, or sorry, for Linux, Windows, and uh, OS X. And it was the bane of my existence. Because <laughs> they, they all kind of like use um, setup.py as their framework for execution and uh, bootstrapping, which is like a terrible idea because when you're trying to use them at the same time, they all do things differently and they interfere with each other. Um, I think that Portable executables is fantastic, and if you're going to be building anything for users, um, you know, an actual like consumable application, then uh, you know, I think that's the, the target, right? Like, why would it be anything else? So, um, I really hope more people start building things like that. Um, I think that there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done there because it's super frustrating. I actually talked to the guys at Dropbox. Um, most people don't know this, but the, the entire Dropbox client is written in Python. Um, and it's using these build tools. But basically, like for them to get it to work, they just have like a guy who I met at PyCon. He's really cool. Um, but he like maintains that. And like if he gets hit by a bus, they'll never be able to change it. <laughs> That's like the worst thing ever. And like I actually asked him how he got around certain things, and he's like, oh, I have no idea. And it's just can get you know. So he has to, it's just the worst. So <laughs> I uh, I really hope. Things improve there. I, I was hoping that PyPy actually, since they have a, I think a better architected um, core, I think they might be able to add that pretty easily. I've seen it come up in a mailing list before, but um, I'm not sure. But yeah. Yes. If anyone else wants to build portable executables, I find Py installer much better than Py to be executed in Py to act. Py installer is good. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that Pi Installer is, um, if you're building for the Mac, uh, it's the only one that actually builds them as a, a Unix executable instead of as a, a bundle 
thing like the uh, dot app, uh, which is really great. Uh, what I was doing is I ended up doing PyDXC for Windows and then PyInstaller for the other two, and then ignored things like PD freeze and CX freeze and freeze freeze. <laughs> but yeah, yes. So uh, you're you're pretty active uh, in, with the Blast project. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you feel like uh, Blast is uh, web application development for humans, or if there's room for a, or if there's something that's similar <laughs> even in Blast that fits that role. I, uh, the question was, do I see Flask as web application development for humans or something else? Um, I think it depends on what your definition of web application development is. For me, I think that it absolutely is that, but I really think that Flask is uh, HTTP servers for humans, basically. Because um, like, basically what you're doing is you're crafting responses and, and responding to them with simple routes. That's really all Flask is, as opposed to, you know, enforcing some kind of architecture or some way of thinking about your code. So uh, for me, it definitely is. But I stay in, I try to stay in the web services realm as much as possible. And a lot of people really like um, the way Django does things. I'm not one of those people. But <laughs> <laughs> I do like the way Django does things. I just, if I'm going to build something, I usually try to build a web service before um, anything else. So. I think, yeah, so for me, like for, for the Python guide, the two things I recommend are Django and Flask, basically. I think those should fit almost all of your use cases. Um, you know, obviously there's tremendously more, but it should be the obvious first picks. I don't think the, a, pers a person who's just getting into Python should dive into Twisted to write an MVC app. Um, but maybe they should, I don't know. Will it support Python 3 eventually, Flask? Uh, yeah, they're working on it this weekend, actually. Um, the question was, is, is Flask going to support Python 3? Um, Armin has, I'm good friends with Armin, and he has been very much on a triad against Python 3. He actually didn't come to PyCon this year because he didn't want to spoil everyone's party by playing it up Python 3 the whole time. Uh, but I think he's finally coming to terms, the fact that it's happening. And uh, he, uh, he just wrote a blog post today, or yesterday, about um, he had a big, so he, he ported Jinja 2 to Python 3. Uh, a couple years ago, and it was actually broken for a year, and no one noticed, which was a big testament to him of why this is a big waste of time for him at the time. Uh, but basically, the port was really, it was done poorly, and it was like a big fork. I think there was two versions of the code base inside one repo, and it was ugly, and now uh, everyone's kind of developed a better way to support both at the same time. And, um, and now, I think he just had a hackathon last weekend in London to um, port it, properly, and it, it's done now, and the blog post is a big, like, lessons learned, and I think Flask is next on the board, so I'm really excited to see that happen, because if it didn't, I was going to be very upset. <laughs> um, I actually told him if, if he wasn't going to do it, that I, as much as I'd hate to spend that much time on that, I would have taken, I would have done the work, because, like, work is always really complicated, and I usually try to stay at high-level things, but I was going to kind of offer to dive in head first if I had to, but he's doing it now, so I'm very, very hopeful. <clears throat> yes? So what would be the one obvious way to structure where your test directories are with respect to a package hierarchy? Um, maybe the context would help a little bit here, is that we have a monolithic web service and we're breaking it down into a framework for a very thin level web service so we can tie in a web app and another web service on top of it. Mm -hmm. So, so my the kind of namespace to with, with the test directory. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so my traditional uh, suggestion to people uh, and recommendation is that at first I just have a file called test underscore library name dot pot and I put all my tests in there and it's above the package. Yeah, so say, let's say it's at the root of the repository. Mm -hmm. When you have a package available at this real package name in the repo, I have test package name up high. And then you can import it regularly, everything works um, without doing any like um, module hacking and path hacking. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, when you have more than you know 20 tests, uh, you want to break map files. So then what I personally do is I, I create a tests directory at that same level, and I start putting them in, in there, and then I'll, you know, Hat, basically. Is this in Python guide? Uh, I wrote a blog post about it and I said I was going to put it into the guide because <coughs> it's for the guide. I don't remember if it's in yet. I think it is though. Right. Actually, let's, let's find out. <laughs>
while you're looking it up, uh, the hack that I did is I just added in, in, in the test directory that all the tests would have. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm happy that I did it. I'm sure. Uh, any tests? Ah, I even used the same number, 20 tests. That's good. All right, awesome. <laughs> Please don't consistent. Um, sorry, what were you saying? No, that, I, I, I was just... Now, I feel like, like if you're using a Django thing and there's a lot of like sub packages that are portable, like I feel it's, this isn't like a one, I don't think this suits every, every need, but um, I think it's a good first shot, basically. Because it, it gets really complicated. And this is, it's unfortunate that it gets so complicated. Um, but I think, so I need to double check, but I believe that there's something in Python 3.3 that allows you to basically, there's like a test discovery functionality that's in there now. Okay, unit test has that in 2.7 and in 2.2. Okay, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, well, like nose? Uh, like nose, yeah. yeah. But it, like, it makes it part of the first standard library instead of just kind of everyone doing their own thing. So I think that'll help a lot. Thank you. And they just added it in Django as well, their own thing for defining that. Because before it was just kind of like everyone does their own thing and it was super complicated. So, yeah. Yes. How do you convince people to write documentation? <laughs> I forced him to use my code. <laughs> um, in what in what context? Um, I've been in many projects where like there's a lot of stuff going on in the code base and things are constantly shifting underneath the feet, and I'm constantly wishing for documentation. Or even on the other side of that, where I'm making lots of changes that I know other people are going to want documentation for, but I don't know what's a good place to put it or a good way to write it. So I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for the one true way to do it. I, I feel like the best thing for me is to try to write documentation. I'm going to say, that's not true. Hang on. I was going to say the best thing to do is write documentation before you write functionality. Um, but I don't actually end up doing that all the time. So, I don't know. It, uh, it depends. I, I feel like I, I feel like if you have really nice, it is going to sound weird, this is really what I believe. I feel like if you have really beautiful docs, like really nice theme with the docs, and it's really easy to build, it doesn't take any work, like they just kind of add the code and it's there. I, it really encourages me to start writing docs, because it's like I'm starting to build towards this really nice you know, thing I'm proud of, as opposed to just like this thing I'm typing in my basement and writing, it's boring. I don't know. That's just me, though. I don't think I'm, I don't know if everyone's like that or not. That, that really helps a lot. Like, like, I don't want to write a blog post on a blog that looks ugly. Like, like, if it looks really nice, it inspires me to actually do the work to do that. So, I don't know. Is that, is that a good answer? I feel like that was a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is get a typographer. <laughs> Or well, find a great space thing. Like that's really what it is for me personally, um, and making it just as easy as possible. For the doc. Like just you know, put slap the doc build into CI, uh, and have them have everyone access it constantly. And I feel like they're not going to be, you know, if, if they're good, people will start using them and they'll rely on them, and then they'll want to improve them. Um, if there's nothing there yet, uh, you know, that's something that needs to, as a change, needs to, needs to take place first before that'll. Uh, I have a question. I started to use Python recently, and I was surprised that there are like Python 2 and Python 3, and it's like two different beasts, yes. and they actually exist in a separate branches, and they're not going actually like to merge, or one is going to die. I mean, this is actually the first time in my life I saw some language that actually does not support the old version, or you can switch to another version, and the first release is actually like deprecated. What is the idea behind these two parallel universes? Um, so the, the, the question is, what is the difference between basically what's the difference between Python two and Python three, and why that it, why it's necessary? I guess the question like like life cycle. Uh, is it supposed to be like this forever? I mean, what is the idea there? So currently, what happens is that there, there's Python two which is basically what everyone's using on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's Python 3, which has existed for like five to six years now, um, which has only this year become considered production ready. Um, and it's taken a while because it needs to be built, it needs to be tested, and there's so many changes to the language that it's hard and unobvious 
um, what needs to be improved for it to be production ready. So now with Python 3.3 as it's been released, um, the stamp production ready from the Python 4 team has been applied, and now um, people are going to start using both. And it's going to be, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. Uh, because right now it's pretty obvious to use two, unless you can use three. But um, you know, in the next uh, two years, it's going to be there's going to have they're going to have a lot of libraries that only work on one, not the other. Um, and the only way really is for people to to just support three as fast as possible. And all the mainstream libraries are doing that. Um, and as soon as everyone else, you know, in another year, I'd say people will be using three a lot more than they are now. And then it'll be up ahead. To address your question about why there are both, after 20 years or so of development of Python 2, there were a number of things in the language that they didn't like anymore and they wanted to break backwards compatibility in order to improve the language. And so they took the break from Python 2 to Python 3 to make the improvements in the language. Python 2 is going to be around for a really long time. Um, there will probably be, you know, they just released 2.7.5 this week, there will probably be a 2.76, and a 7.7, and a 7.8 as they fix bugs, but they're not going to add any more new features to 2.7. So Python 2 feature is end, has ended, important fixes will go in, but all the new feature work is going into Python 3. Okay, let me ask this. For example, Kenneth complained that in Python 3, you can't use this old tree with space, you have to put parentheses around. That's right. <laughs> it's supposed to be improvement. It's an improvement because now print is a function, which means that you can change how it behaves. And it means when they want to add features to it, they don't have to invent wacky syntax like they did in Python 2. Because in Python hacked before. Right. In Python 2, to print to a file, they invented syntax of greater than, greater than, <laughs> file, comma, which, which makes no shift, sense. Right? I, it just, Obviously. It, there's no need for print to be a statement. There's it's a function. Okay. Yeah. I'm just complaining can, the good I'm news so is, to Python 2, basically. The good news is you can stick with Python 2. <laughs> it's going to be a long time before stuff shows up that only works on Python 3, although well, that will happen. I actually have a theory of Python. Because, because then it won't, the language won't move forward. The language will move forward. You won't. <laughs> <laughs> I have a theory that Python 2.7 is going to be the most modern, stable language in, in history, basically. Because it will never be modified, and it's definitely the most modern out of those. So if you're going to build something for real, true, long-term stability, build it for Python 2.7. Actually, this gets an interesting one of the questions from the RSVPs. You, on your slides, you started with an example of how Ruby is nice and clean, and how Python was ugly, and you had to make requests in order to make it pretty again. Why use Python? <laughs> Python has F20. <laughs> is Python awesome? I feel like, that, so Python is normally awesome. And Python is normally very clean and pretty. And I'm, I'm basically just trying to show where that is consistent. Now, that's the big thing for me. Python in general is, is fantastic, and it's by far the best language for me. Um, I, I guess I should make it more clear in my talk. <laughs> yeah. Those are your questions. Yes. So one of the, one of the, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things that you stressed in your talk was that um, you'd like to focus on the 90% case as opposed to the 10% case. So when you were developing features, you know, there's, when you're developing a new framework, there's clearly a lot of 30% cases, 50%, you know, like a lot of things, you know, there's like, you know, there's the obvious 10% case, the obvious 90% case. What for, what was your criteria for drawing the line between, you know, what was getting overly complicated, you wait for it versus what, like, we're just going to go into the first release, you know, no. Um, for me in particular, it was, it was a difficult thing to figure out. And it was something I, I changed over time as well. So um, I, I did add features that have been removed since, uh, with the 1.0 release that removed. Um, some, like, for example, when you do a post request and there's a, a redirect on it, um, the RFC says that you, if you're going to follow it up, you have to basically, the user has to authorize it, and then uh, it'll follow it up with another post request. Every browser in the world does a GET request instead of a post request. Um, so I added a strict mode that uh, was, I think, enabled by default. Um, <coughs> and you know, so like that, there was this forking that was happening, this branching in the, in the logic, where he's like, you know, if if uh, strict mode <coughs> do it properly, if not, then do it the way browsers do. And um, eventually, this kind of figured out that I, I try to avoid that situation at all now. So now it just does what the browsers do because no one wants it to be any other way, basically. And if they do, they can just turn off redirects and do it themselves. Um, and that's something that really took a long time to figure out. Um, and I think it's different for every project and every library. Uh, 
the thing that I really learned the most is how to say no, basically. Um, it was really, really important to say no to a lot of features that people ask. Because people ask for a lot of things. Um, and they're going to ask for things that seem reasonable and things that seem unreasonable. And the things that seem reasonable um, can be deceptively complex. Uh, and that's basically, I try to, if anything's going to add code that um, seems unnecessary, I try to say no now. But it's because it's pretty mature. So I think, it, I think it really depends on the project and the maturity level and the goals of the project. But um, I think that's, that's like half the battle, basically, of maintaining a project, is trying to figure out where that line draws. So it sounds like in a way you kind of, it sounds like in a way you were utilizing the fact that you have an open source project, you can kind of just listen to your customers, you know, your, your users basically, and yeah. adapt things based off what their usage pattern was. Yeah, it's more of like a product design type of thing. I actually just did a talk about this last week. Um, it's called Growing Open Source Seeds, and I kind of went over the different styles of projects. Basically, I said there are um, public source projects, which is like a company like Facebook releasing their pipe, their, their SDK publicly, but like it's not really open source. You know, there's like a thousand issues open, and I wasn't going to comment on any of them. Uh, and then you have um, things that are very like in open investments, which is like GitTip or Django or Python, where all the decisions are kind of shared between everybody. Um, and it's like this really important project that people rely on, and the goal is to affect, you know, change the world. And then I, you have projects like requests, which I call a dictatorship project, which is basically me making all the decisions. And I'll listen to everybody, but uh, I you know, listen to everybody and then disregard, disregard it and try to make the best decision myself, as opposed to getting a lot of other people involved in the decision-making process. Because I think the value of at least this project is the opinions that it has, and if you have a lot of other people involved, I think it'll dilute it. And um, be, I think the, the, the dictatorship is what makes that possible. Um, but on that theme, you said that you only rejected two pull requests out of hundreds. That was Python guy. No, not oh, requests. Python guy. No, Got no, no. Okay. Yeah, requests, I've rejected thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Probably only 500. But yeah. I, try to, I, I also try to be as, as um, positive and, um, what's the word? Dictatorial. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, when someone sends, you know, I, I try to be as very thankful and positive as possible and encouraging, uh, even if I don't uh, accept it. And I tell them why and I encourage them to send more. Um, it's not like I don't want people to contribute, I definitely do. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not. <laughs> yes? <laughs> so you've mentioned a couple times about features that you've added in um, and then later decided to, to take out. And so I guess the question there for me is, what, at what point do you decide that, uh, hey, this is a feature that's not being used, I should remove it, or hey, this is a feature that's not being used, I'm just going to leave it here for the people who do? Because, I mean, there's certainly a point where it's, you want to keep the code you know, clean and, and document and such, but there's also kind of that point of, people, some people might be using this, do I really want to take that away from them? Like, well, how do you strike that balance? Uh, so, for me, it was really, I mean, I did that, and I had some people complain. Um, I asked for feedback, and I got a little bit, but not a whole lot. And of course, the people who really cared weren't on the line at the moment when I asked, you know, and they, they all the, the pitchforks and stuff they raised. I don't know. It's it's um. It's I think it's just a, it's something I have to just, just kind of go with your gut, I guess. <laughs> is really my answer. Um, and yeah, I, ideally having data is the best case scenario, but with open source projects, you usually don't have. Um, One way to help is if it has tests. <laughs> It has a prayer of not being broken, <coughs> so then maybe it's worth keeping. Yeah, if you have to remove tests, it's usually that's not. Unless it's a crazy, crazy test. <laughs> Let's take two more questions. Yes. Um, speaking about tests, I noticed how you said that you only know, start with the readme and go introducing the code from the readme. So, um, how best would you say to incorporate like tests into your workflow, especially if you have a like, test driven development? Mm -hmm. So I consider this API-driven development, and I think a really good way to enforce that is to uh, is to basically you know if you're gonna write you can write a readme with all your things, and then write tests for each of those examples, and then start building it that way. Um, but you know that's not test-driven development. This is kind of like tacking it on to this other thing. So it's uh, I think you can definitely do both at the same time. So for the README thing, I, I mean, that was just for coming up with the initial API, not for the, the lower level stuff. So if you're doing real GED, 
uh, you know, you're not writing really good unit tests. Every tiny little backend thing, it's not the, the porcelain API that the users are using should be tested as well. So those two can totally exist. Eddie, last question? Sure. Um, what's the best, most obvious way to provide like a stir or a wrapper for an object? Uh, by writing the wrapper? <laughs> I, dude, like, I, yeah, every project like has a different format or whatever for what it actually helps with. I guess, I guess mine always look like um, you know the brackets and then um, the name of the object, and I, I have to do the the ID thing. It's like is it percent D or something? Percent uh, the hex represents where the memory location is. Yeah, ID. Yeah, ID we could do. Oh yeah, percent. But there, there's a percent. Is there? Value. Yeah, it's the exact. Look it up. Anyway, um, I don't think so. Um, but actually, so it turns out that the language that Python was based on, which I can't remember the name of, ABC, ABC yeah. uh, that was actually like its core feature, which is super awesome. But I don't think that really works in the modern world anymore. But I like the, the concept. Um, so basically, what I've had to do is if it's representing a dictionary, I'll try to put the value in there. Unless it's um, you know the, the actual keys and values, but in the ideal world, you're not supposed to treat dictionaries that way. You're supposed to treat them as if they um, you don't know how many you know they're it could be n-sized. So um, I don't know. It's kind of tricky. I think it basically all of mine look the same. Um, you know, I just kind of I make them look like the buildings <coughs> that you see, but it's uh, uh, it depends. Good question. All right. All right. Thank you, Thank Dan. You. Now, We're going to take a quick break, stretch your legs, and get something to drink. Um, we'll be milling around chatting for about 10 minutes. We're going to get set up for some lightning talks. Don't forget that after the lightning talks, we're going to go to Mead Hall to drink Heroku Lost Free Beer. Ken, do you want to say anything more about Heroku? Um, is it awesome?